Perfect. So we are going to end today the series entitled Size Does Matter, and we've come a long way in a short time. This is a four-week series, so if this is your first Sunday, highly recommend that you listen to the previous three weeks of all the conversations that we have had because we have kind of walked through this process of understanding, first and foremost, that the size of our excuses do matter. The things that we use in our life to justify the reasons why we're not moving to our next level when the reality is that God always wants us to be growing, uh, to becoming more like Him, and to glorifying Him more and more in the earth. And then week two, we talked about the size of the way that we view ourselves. Our thinking about ourselves actually does matter. Because if you view yourself to be small, you'll be small in the sight of other people. They'll treat you that way. And you'll never really accomplish anything huge in your life. And so those two things definitely matter. And then the last week was that our honor toward others matters. The size of our honor toward others matters. That because your next level, whatever that is in your life, it doesn't care if it's your marriage, your finances, your job, your raising kids, whatever you have kind of in your life that you need to move to that next level, it is absolutely 100% dependent on the support of somebody else. So we talked about how to build a, um, a really cool supportive community around us where we're all moving in the same direction to help each other get there. So today we're going to talk about, in light of that entire journey and some scriptures that we're going to look at today, that the size of our goals matter. I'm going to read to you a verse of scripture as we start out. Because what I'm going to do is over-explain this scripture that most people quote, but they never understand what it means. And it's found in Proverbs 29, verse 18, says this, where there is no vision. I say vision. People cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. So we, we talk about that verse a lot inside the church world, and people say, okay, if I don't have a vision, then I live life um, by the seat of my pants. I kind of just run around, run amok. If you're from the South, you know what that means. If you're not, you have no idea what that means. You can go look that up somewhere on Google, I'm sure. Um, but you just kind of live life hoping some things happen. But we never really talk about what does it actually mean, because that word vision translated means prophetic dream, prophetic vision, like looking into the future. Well, nobody in here knows your future. There's only one person that knows your future, and that's God. So what the writer is talking about in Proverbs is you've got to literally spend time with God to get a vision of what you could be, look like, accomplish in the next 10 years of your life. I tell people all the time, always have at least a 10-year vision for your life, and that is regardless of your age. So if you're in here and you're 80, 75, 70, 65, 60, and we can keep going down the line, does not matter your age Press forward into what God has for you, because if your memories are bigger than your dreams, you're just waiting to die. Like, I know that's very challenging to say to this entire crowd, but it is 100% true. If, if you can only have memories of what your life used to be and you're not looking forward to what your life could be, then really you're just breathing air waiting on your last day. And that's not God's design for you. God's design for you is to absolutely live life to the fullest no matter your age. So if you're 80 and you go, well, 10-year vision, maybe five. How about a five-year vision? Because I'm 80. Well, how about a 10? Because the Bible says you can live 120. You're just 80. Look at me. You're just 80. Look at somebody that looks like they might be 80 and go, you're just 80. Okay? No, I saw some of y'all look at some young people go, you're just 80. Okay? So, <laughs> age is just a number. It really is. You're as old as you believe yourself to be. I know a lot of people who are in the senior part of their years who absolutely do live life to the fullest. And let me tell you why people in that age bracket typically live life better than those in their 20s because they know how precious life is. So don't wait around for something tragic to happen to you in order for you to get a grasp on the greatest gift you've been given today, and that was you woke up. Look at me. You woke up. And we can all have our excuses. We talked about this week one. Yeah, but I woke up with. I've got this. I have this thing in my life. And you can excuse yourself from the blessing table of the Lord and not experience life to the fullest. Or you can say, I'm not going to make excuses. At least I'm breathing today. You can celebrate where you are and continually move forward. So we're going to talk about goals. Let's say goals. I'm going to give you five statements concerning goals that are 100% scriptural. 
Setting goals in your life is not a good business tactic. It's not a good pattern of life tactic, even though a lot of people teach it that way. It is absolutely scriptural for your life. Because God says where people that don't have vision cast off restraint, what that really means is a plan, a goal for their life. And the end of that statement, it says that we heed wisdom's advice. Well, listen to what wisdom says in Proverbs 24, 3 through 6. By wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is full of strength, and a man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance, you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Let me tell you what that verse of Scripture is saying. It's a southern saying. Work smarter, not I mean, you know that's true. I've mean, been living long enough to know I don't have to pick that heavy thing up all by myself. I mean, you know this is true. How many young guys in here pick up real heavy stuff that makes you make weird noises? Okay, stop doing that. Put that down. Call somebody over to help you. Like this is literally in the context he's really talking about building a house, but he's trying to see you what it takes to build a life. Nobody, well, some people in here decided to build a dog house with no plan. How many of you did that? You thought, I'll just go in the backyard, build me a dog house or a tree house. Or you decided to build something, but you didn't sketch nothing out. You didn't even put it on a napkin. How many rednecks know what I'm talking about? Write that down on a napkin. That's about that long. That's about that long. Listen, that's better than no plan at all. But some of y'all built some stuff and just thought it'd be a good idea. And you backed up and looked at it and went, that is terrible. I mean, your dog wouldn't even sleep in it. It went over to the tree and slept underneath the tree because that was a rickety piece of junk you built. Why? Because you had no plan. You didn't know where you were going. This proverb is saying nobody does that. Like, we know that to be ignorant, don't we? So if you're going to build your home that you currently live in or you bought your home, you didn't build it, but you bought it, somebody built it, here's what they did. They hired somebody smarter than them. They wrote out plans called blueprints, and they measured it, and they talked about it, and they got consultants to talk about it. They talked to the house owner, not the house builder. I mean, that's the difference. Like, I, well, the bank owns part of it, and I own part of it, but, like, the house builder is somebody who's a professional who knows how to get it done. Y'all talk a lot, and they hire other people to do things they can't do. Now, when Benet and I built our houses, we always wanted to save or cut corners or save costs and do something on our own. How many of you ever done that? How many of you realize that costs you more money in the long run? It costs you more time in the long run. So the best thing to do is just like, hey, you know what? I'm going to talk to some really smart people that know things I don't know to allow them to help me build something worth living in. The problem is we don't do that with our life. We just live by default and hope it happens instead of drawing out a blueprint to make happen what we want to happen. A goal is actually not a dream. It's not a good idea. It's something out there that I see and I develop smaller steps to get to the big thing that I want and I live on that purpose every single day. That's what Proverbs 24, 3 through 6 is talking about. So the first statement you need to understand is this. Without goals, an individual wanders aimlessly through life. You just kind of hang out and hope stuff happens and really that's why you're super frustrated. That's why you develop excuses. You develop excuses to justify your wandering, and you also blame other people for why you're not achieving. You blame yourself. You get into this this rotating, revolving life where you're just moving around through life but never accomplishing anything. Where you have been, look at me, where you have been and where you are does not matter. Too many of you are living your life based on where you've been or where you are, and so the most important thing is where you want to go. Where do you want to be next week? Where do you want to be next year? Where do you want to be in 10 years? Stop stop living life looking in the rearview mirror or in the console of your current seating position. How many of you have had a wreck driving down the road looking for the cell phone that dropped in the console? How many know somebody who had a wreck doing that or looked at the current text that came in? Stop looking at the current situation or your past. Focus on the future. I must say vision. That's what it means to get a vision, and I'm telling you, life will ultimately be fun. So get a 10-year, look at your neighbor and say, 10 years. Now look back at them and say, yes, 10. Get a 10-year vision of where you want to be, 
just understand this principle that we've tried to hammer. The accomplishment of that 10-year plan is dependent on the support of somebody else. Listen to what Jesus says. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything and ask for it, it will be given to you by God in heaven. How many married people in here? Look, you already got two. Y'all got that, right? I know we preach one flesh, but as soon as there's two, y'all become one flesh. You already got two. So if you're in here, look at me. This is so important. If you're in here and you're married and you're not making progress and reaching your goals, let me tell you why. This, this is going to be hard to receive, but it's true. This, this is why. You're not touching to agree on it. You're touching to, to discuss it or disagree on it. Because the, let me ask you a question. Okay, okay. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Let's do this. All right. How many of you in here believe the Bible's true? There's some of you not raising That's okay. How many, like for real, you're here, look, you're in church. You came. So you came because Jesus, like you are in love with the Lord and you believe the word is true. Or you came because what you were trying to do wasn't working. So you thought to give this a shot. Right? Like that's, that's basically where we're all at. We all are like, whoo, I got the t-shirt, got baptized. I am in. I love the Lord because I screwed up. How many of that's true for you? Okay, some of you, that was like six people raised y'all saying, we need to do an invitation call right now. Who wants to be saved? Okay, because y'all hadn't got to the end of you. Okay, so look, there's some of you just on the journey. You're like, well, <laughs> that crap I've been doing ain't working. How many of you figured that out? That's why you're here. So let me ask you, how many of you believe the Bible is true? For real, like for real. Okay, look, Jesus says, how many of you know the, the letters in red are super important? Because that means Jesus is saying it. So, so, like, if you want to argue, well, Paul wrote it. Okay, whatever. But if Jesus said it, how many of you know important? We're all on the same page now? Okay. He said, look, two of y'all people agree on something, like, touch it. That means in unity. And ask for it, God's going to give it to you. <laughs> One person in the whole auditorium said, that's right. One person, there was somebody on Facebook, I heard them, way far off in Arkansas. But I'm just telling you, it's true. And the reason married people, how can you be in judgment? No, I'm not. I'm telling you my story. Benet and I were in disagreement for a lot of years, and we didn't get crap done but argue. How many, know, how many married couples know what I'm talking about? You got an amen, but oh me, you're right. Like, and then all of a sudden, we decided like, crap. The Bible's true. <laughs> and like, it just says, if I love you like Christ loved the church and you submit to me. Let me read that for you one more time, babe. Submit to me. No, I'm just <laughs> submit to me as under the Lord. And where two of us are in unity, touch anything and agree on it. If I say agree on it. Agree. Listen to the promise. God's going to give it to you. So if you're in here and it's not happening, I got to pause on this one statement because I got I to gotta just be real cut and dry with you because I love you. Then it means you're touching it to argue about it or discuss it. At some point, you got to grow up in the Lord and go, hey, look, Jesus said if, if you and I can get on the same page, it's like going to happen. I didn't say it'd be easy. I said it's going to happen. So, like, if you can just get, I, like, if you don't hear anything else I say for the next 30 minutes and you just get that, like, I've helped you a ton. Because too many, too many married couples argue over it, and what you don't understand is in disagreement, disunity happens, and you can't grow. But as soon as unity hits that thing, you can, so you're thinking, well, well I'm single. Then get a best friend. Y'all get shoulder to shoulder. Agree on, listen, if you're looking for a man or a woman because you need a marriage, it's because you're in disagreement that it hadn't happened yet. You haven't found somebody to agree with you, and you're in disagreement with God's plan for single life, and so it's just you're, you're pushing out what you desire because you're dishonoring, honestly, the word. And whatever you dishonor moves away from you. How many of you in here want the Lord to move away from you? Just be like right here. Hey, hey, hey. And I'm not saying he's left you or forsaken you. What I'm saying is, is, you're not pursuing and you're not pressing in and you're not, you're in disagreement. So if you'll just get into agreement, and I say agreement, all married people, all single people, all single again people, all single again and again people, wherever you're at, get you a friend, like a real one, that really means it, 
Get in agreement. Be in unity on that thing and watch your goals start to happen. Now listen, I'm going to tell you, agreement's not enough. Discipline is the bridge between having a dream and living one. Here's what that means. You're going to have to do hard stuff. How many older people just know that's true? How many people in here 38 years old and younger? Raise your hand. 38 and younger. Raise, get up. Okay, you can put it down. I'm about to set y'all free. All the old people are going to slap you if you don't listen to me right here. Because they're going to be so frustrated because they're going to they're gonna see it go right over your head. And some old person is going to go, they'll probably tell me to say it again right after they slap you in the back of the head. How many, ever had a whole, how many older people had an older person slap you in the back of the head and it was a good thing? You're like, yeah, I should have I listened. Okay, this is one of those moments. Don't slap nobody, but you can, you can look at them real stern. Like, okay. 38 and younger, listen to me. Listen to me. Live hard now so you can live easy later or live easy now so you will have to live hard later. Old people, look, all the young bucks in here, look around, the young buckuses or whatever you call those people. Look around the auditorium, and all the older people is like, amen, pastor. They, they won't, they're telling you, don't end up like I is right now. <laughs> Living hard, can't retire, paying stuff off, because I wanted to live easy. Went to the bar and the club and hung out and borrowed money for that and borrowed money for that. They all would like to slap you in the face right now and tell you, listen, because that's the truth. Why? Because people with no vision, the Bible also says they perish. They do dumb stuff. They make mistakes because they don't know where they're going. They think, here's what you think. Here's what you say. Every young person, I did it. <laughs> it's all going to work out. <laughs> Calm down, Daddy-O. I got it. And you woke up one day and didn't have it. Am I right? So listen. Listen to what I'm telling you, because if you'll just please clap for the Lord, because that's who said it, not me. <laughs> so the most important, third statement, the most important thing you can do in planning and getting a vision is this. Know where you're going before you start. There's a, there may be one or two people in here, and you're, you're the people who said, it's going to be all right. Like, you never went on vacation or took a trip that you didn't at least know where you're going. Now, you may not have scheduled your hotels out because you thought that would be cool to run around town and see if we can find a hotel and you, sure that, you figured out that didn't work out. You know what I'm saying? But, like, you knew where you was going. So when you start out in life, take a moment, seek the Lord, find out where you're going, and then make it super, super clear as to what that looks like. Demand for yourself a clear vision, not a muddy one. 95% of the people in the earth get what they don't want because they never decide what it is they want. So on this little card, it should have been on your chair when you came in, it says size matters on it. On there's a front and a back. On the front side, which is the one that has the graphic on it, I've given you a 10-year planning guide. Here's all I did. I identified what is known as the six pillars of life on this card. What does that mean? The six most important areas of your life, and pretty much it's the only areas in your life. You could break them up and separate maybe one of them and kind of ease it out a little bit. So here's what I did. I gave you, as a married couple, discussion questions just to start your thinking about what kind of goals do I need to have mentally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, physically, or financially. So there's questions, discussion questions, because here's what I want you to do. I want you to go from this, this conversation to have a conversation. So if you're single, get a buddy over and y'all talk this out. Why? Because once you answer these questions, then I want you to get into agreement because the Bible says if we agree on anything and ask for it, it's going to happen. But you've got to start asking the questions because people don't ask questions, they just do. So spiritual, ask yourself this question. How many minutes each morning am I going to spend in reading the Bible in prayer? Very few of us have asked that question. Here's what we do. We get up. And we read until we feel like it's good. Right? Oh, okay. I read two verses. Whew. Solid. I even read a 
Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. Read Psalms 1 and Matthew 15. Okay. Well, listen. Awesome. But what if that's not enough to get you where you need to be today? Because you never pause to just ask the question, listen to the the question, how much time do I need to spend with the Lord today? I may require a whole lot. You may not require that much because of where you're at on your journey. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So ask the question for you. Ask this question, how, how can I, if I say I, improve my individual or personal worship time? What does that mean? Look, don't be worshiping the Lord to music just on Sunday at 11. And look here, not just on your car ride to work, but develop a personal worship time where you're going to put Hillsong Television or Bethel TV on your television, and that's what's going through your house. And every now and then you find yourself in the living room talking about just, and you, here's what you're going to say, well, that's weird. Yeah, but we're called to have a personal relationship with the Lord. And you, at some point, how awesome would it be if your spouse or your kid saw you in the middle of the living room talking about just singing away? Because it says make a joyful noise to the Lord. Like you ain't even got to carry a tune in five gallon bucket. You just, you just let her rip, Tater Chip, have a good old time with you and Jesus, and it'll be amazing. What would it look like if we all developed that? So you can go through the six pillars, mental. Listen to me. How many books are you going to read this year? How many, okay, how many of you hate reading? Hate it. Hate it. Raise your hand. It's okay. Raise your hand. Okay. I'm raising my hand because I don't like it either. Right, put your hand down. How many of you love it? I'll give you a book right now. You read the whole thing. It's amazing. I love reading. Okay. Everybody that raised your hand said they love reading. It takes zero discipline for you to love hating. I mean, love reading. Why? Here's what discipline. I don't love, I don't have to take any discipline. You love hate. Book, book, read. <laughs> discipline is your ability to do the things you hate to have the life you want. So I have to read if I want to improve my mental state. Part of that's reading scripture. The other part is reading books that help me become the best version of me. So what if I told you, I want you to read 32 books this year? <laughs> You'd be like, whoa, 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 man, I quit school. I ain't trying to go back. Okay. For the length of the average book, how many think you could read... 20 pages a day. I mean, I can do. Even if you don't like reading, you could do 20 pages a day. If you read 20 pages a day, you'll read 32 books in a year. Don't let the size of your goals scare you. Learn how to break them down in little tiny increments so you can accomplish them. So here's what I want you to do. Just read 12. Just read 12. That's one book a month. That's like five pages a day. How many, you, how many know you can do that? Like, for real, I can do that. Even if I, even I'm a mess up and miss one day, I can do 10 the next. Like, double up a little bit. Like, I'm just telling you, it's 100% possible, but are you asking yourself those kind of questions so you can grow mentally? Are you asking yourself the kind of questions like, what negative thoughts do I need to eradicate so I can grow emotionally? Um, relationally, ask your spouse this question. How many nights a week are we going to have a date night? And consistently do it every single week. Now, most married couples don't have that conversation. They say, we need, here's what they say, we need to have a date night. Well, you needing to have one and writing it down and calendaring it and making it a priority is two different things. Like every married couple in here, if you just write it down, have a discussion, it will probably happen. Um, physical, that's easy. Everybody does that first part of January, but we all suck at it later, so... Um, financial, listen, here's a question nobody asked. I didn't even ask this question until I was taught this. How much money would I like to invest in the kingdom this year? Here's what people say. Well, 10% every two weeks or 10% every week. No, 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 that's the start. How much would you like if you dreamed big, did a 10-year plan, how much would you like to give to the kingdom every year? Nobody thinks that way because we don't think in the context of goals. We don't think in the context of vision. And then, next statement is, you have to write those goals down. So take those six pillars of life, have a discussion, begin to develop goals, and then write them down. If you write them down, you're 42% more likely to get them done. Which means if you don't write them down, what? 42% likely not to get them done. So 
writing them down is super, super important. And never, ever be afraid to dream big. Just make them smarter. Most people usually teach on smart goals. Um, we teach on smarter goals, which is on the back side of your card. Here's all it means. And it has little definitions. You can go and read this, but I'll give it to you. It means specific, measurable, actionable, risky. Everybody say risky. Look at me. Do not make a safe goal. If you make a safe goal, you won't try because it doesn't cost you anything if you don't hit it. Here's what that is. That's called a good idea, not a God idea. And too many people waste their life on good ideas instead of living for the glory of God. Make the goal risky. Make it time keyed. What's that mean? Have, put a deadline on it. How many know what a deadline is? How many, how many don't know? I'll tell you if you don't. Like, that means it's the deadline. How many of you have a job that requires deadlines? I'm about to help you and your employer. That means the drop dead date when it's absolutely due. There is no extension. Hey, can we get an extension on this deadline? No. You knew two years ago. You knew a year ago. You knew six months ago that was the deadline. Do you know why you didn't make the deadline? Look at me. I'm going to set all y'all free. It's amazing. Your employer can send me a check later. Because it wasn't exciting to you. That's what the E means. Make it exciting and then make it relevant. The single most, the greatest single most quality between a person who gets stuff done and the person who does it is one thing, passion. passion. Passion is connected to purpose. If you don't know why you're here, you don't live passionately, you live in mediocrity. Like, having safe goals and just coasting through life and everything that you can achieve sets up for you to live a life of mediocrity, and a smarter goal creates passion in your life. And here's what passion does for you, it creates power, because you know what's gonna happen? If it's a 10-year goal, do you know it's going to get hard at some point? Let me know that. Passion is the thing that keeps you moving forward. Do you know why they call it the passion of Christ? Does it ever hit you why they call it that? Because the Bible literally says he, in, he did not like, he despised the shame that he had to endure, and he endured the cross for the joy set before him. Why? Because he was passionate about the goal he was going to accomplish. He knew when it was all said and done, he would resurrect from the grave, take the keys of death and hell one time, once and for all, for all of humanity, and it was in that that he didn't quit. He was passionate. Look at me. This is, this is difficult, but it's true. The reason your marriage is not great is because you're not passionate about marriage. The reason you have issues with your kids is because you're not passionate about raising kids. You were passionate about having sex, but you weren't passionate about what it delivered. You know, well, we got a couple of mistakes and one plan, so let's just treat them all the same. Kind of hang out. And I'd rather be their friend than their dad. And I'd rather be a mom who's reliving her 17 year old years with my 17 year old daughter we're gonna to go to PCB sorry <laughs> it's true right we've all been there we've all seen it what what's the what's happening they're not passionate about the calling on their life if you get passionate about manhood you'll be a good father if you get passionate about womanhood, you'll be a good mother. You'll be a great spouse because there's passion, and passion overrides difficulty every time. Because life is, life is guaranteed to usher you up stuff that's not fun. Marriage can be fun for a long time, but it does not mean that you're not going to have non-fun moments where you have to have conversations that have healthy conflict so that we can grow in our marriage and our love for each other and our love for God. If you're not passionate, you'll sit in your lazy boy and watch TV. You'll go to Target shopping. You will escape from what brings you greatness. Passion is the key to life. So there's six weapons that the enemy is going to use in your life to, for, to get you to commit success suicide. We've covered some of them. I'll, I'll kind of blow through these. Um, uh, there's five, I'm sorry, five of them. Number one, self-deprecation. We talked about that last week. Number two is security-itis. Let me tell you, if you have a good job, you'll almost always sacrifice getting a greater job. 
because you feel secure and, and you don't want to mess that up. And most people in life miss living their dream because they're in a safe place. The other one is excuse-itis. We covered that in week one. Number four, parental dictation. What does that mean? You have a job and a career that your parents wanted you to have, not the one you wanted. Like you got a degree, you went to school because your parents said this was a good idea, but it was not inside of you. Look at me, parents. Let me help you. Invest and pour into your child's gift, not the talent you wish they had or not the talent you wished you would have had, now you're living through them. Invest in their gifting because they are an individual in the earth birthed through you to change the world, and you're the one that God gave the opportunity to steward their gift. I say gift. So never, ever live vicariously through your child because you didn't get to play ball. You want them to play ball. They may want to play the piano, and that's okay. They may want to paint. That's okay. They may have a beautiful voice, but they won't sing in front of you because you're afraid you'll make fun of them. They need to feel like they need to play soccer. But I'm not saying soccer's bad, but let them sing while they play soccer. Or, you understand what I'm saying? Like, like invest in the gift and be okay with the individual that God birthed into the earth. Never, ever, ever try to create a copy. Let them be individuals. The next one is this, family responsibility. A lot of people forsake their dream because they say, well, I could have changed five years ago, but now. I see this all the time in counseling appointments. People sacrifice living their dream because they're in a certain situation with marriage and children. Here's what happens. Subconsciously, they begin to blame their spouse or their kids for not living their dream, and divorce is real close after that. Never, ever blame somebody else or your situation on your decision not to pursue your dream because everybody in here can do it, regardless of what stage of life you're in. Now, that may take a slow transition, or it may take jumping out the boat and hitting the water so that you'll actually make it happen, but everybody can live their dream. <clears throat> so on the other side is a 30-day um, a improvement guide. Like, I've, I've given you a lot, a, lot of, a lot of stuff to go home and do homework, but here's why. Honest to goodness, Benet and I, like, love y'all a lot. And we want you to have the best life. Jesus says to like, live life to the fullest as much as we can, like, help you. But nobody's talking about this in church because they don't think it's spiritual. If Proverbs says we are messing up our lives because we don't have a vision, there may not be much more spiritual things I can cover than helping you set a goal in life. Because that's what God wants you to pursue. So there's a bunch of things, suggestions on breaking habits. Um, Procrastination is one of them. Negative thoughts is another one. Uh, watching TV more than 60 minutes a day. How many watch TV more than 60 minutes a day? More than one hour you spend watching TV every day. Okay, remember those books we talked about reading? <laughs> well, we, can, we can knock them out. So like if you're watching four hours of TV, if you just cut it down to two hours. And like, how many know reading those books is going to help you more than SpongeBob SquarePants? How do you know that? I guess it's going to help you a whole lot, okay? So, um, acquire these habits and prove, prove my home in these ways. People who are married, show more appreciation to my spouse for the little things that are done that I've always taken for granted. Um, improve my value at work. Listen to me. Law, um, because it's a study that's actually true, uh, more people are, 93% of people are fired because of a bad attitude and not a bad job. So, like, if you want to improve your job atmosphere, number one thing is get a good attitude. If you don't have a good attitude, it's probably because probably you're working a job and you're not living your dream and you don't like it. So the next thing for you to do is decide what is it that I want to do? What is it that I'm passionate about? And turn that into actually making it make money for your life so you can, you can live a dream. Now I'm going to close with a verse of Scripture that we started in. It was one of the verses we gave you for the word of the year. And I want you to hear this verse in the context of the conversation that we've had today. In the context of setting goals, getting a vision for your life, a prophetic vision where God says, this is, this is where I would like you to be in 10 years. This is what God wants your marriage to look like in 10 years. Um, you're raising kids to look like, your financial life to look like, your relational life to look like, your mental life to look like, your emotional life, like whatever. That you really spend time with God. And I want you to hear what God says in Ephesians Chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, in the context of our conversation. Because there, everything that comes from this platform 
I spend a lot of time seeking the heart of God on to ensure that I'm giving you God ideas and not cool stuff. Like I have no desire to entertain you necessarily when you come in here. That's part of it. I don't want to sound like a boring English teacher the whole time. But I also want to give you some godly information that would cause you to grow up into the grace and knowledge of Jesus that you would learn how to display his glory everywhere that you go. And in my humble opinion, Christ followers have no business playing small in the earth. So I'm going to read to you what God says about that in Ephesians. He says, for this reason, in the context of what we're talking about, in the context of this series, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now I want you to hear the identity statement that God himself says to you about your last name. That according to the riches of God's glory, that God may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all all knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Stop. The writer of Ephesians, under the inspiration of Holy Spirit, says it's for this reason that I pray every single day for you. And I want you to know that B'nai and I pray for y'all every single day. And it's this prayer. If you want to have your prayer life change, learn to pray, learn to pray Scripture. God, we just pray that the people who call Epic Church home, along with all people of God in the world, that they would literally get a revelation of how much God loves them, that they would not play small anymore, that they would love themselves so they can love other people, and they would learn to love you so that the world would be changed as you fill them up with who you are. What kind of goals would you set if you really knew God was for you and not against you? What kind of goals would you set if you understood Holy Spirit that was in you? You wouldn't shy away from the most ridiculous thought you've ever had of what you could achieve in 10. Because you know, listen, if I can get one person in my life to just agree with me on this thing, Jesus said that my Father in heaven will make it happen. Imagine that life. Imagine that influence. We wonder why, and we sit and we complain. Why in the world changing? Why is this going on? Why are they having this, and why are they doing that? Because of how we choose to live as God followers. But we have to shoulder that weight and that responsibility, and we have to not be okay with it and decide today I know he's a little nuts and gets fired up, but I'm actually going to take this card that I can't really read because it's so tiny, and I'm going to actually do this. So here's what I'm going to do. I announced this in the, in the last service. I'm going to shoot a video on my Vimeo account, and I'm going to go through um, the 30-day improvement guide and some of the other stuff, and I'm going to over-explain how to do this. I, I travel the country and do this for businesses. I'm going to do it for you. But here's what I need you to do. I need you to email Starla and say, I need the code to get into that um, video. Because here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to shoot a Facebook Live video for information that nobody's going to apply. Like If you want to improve, you are really serious about living out the glory of God, email Starla. She'll email you back the code, and you can go watch a 30 to 35-minute video of me explaining what this really looks like um, as, as small as I can. But this, just so you know, this is a very big deal, and sometimes you just have to do it and trust that God's going to map out the way as you do it. So, like, if you're into it and you're like, okay, 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 I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm living for all that God has for me, but I need a little bit of help. Email Starla, starla.such at epicchurch.tv. She'll send you the code to unlock the video after I get it shot next week, and then, and then you can go watch it, and it'll help you a lot. But 
Stop finding excuses to justify your mediocrity. Live beyond yourself because you serve a God that's beyond you, that's bigger than you, that can set everything in motion so that you can accomplish. Never, ever have a small view of you because you are God's child. The Bible says God's chosen one to do great things in the earth that he prepared for you in advance to do. Never, ever forget, married couples, look at your spouse right now. Single people, look at the best friend you came with. Never, ever forget that your next level is dependent on the support of somebody else. And know that the size of your goals reveals where you are on your spiritual journey. If you plan out really tiny stuff, you play it safe, all it does is reveal, reveal where you're at on your spiritual journey. And I want to up your level a little bit today. I'll see you your 20 and raise you 100. I'll see your 100 and raise you 200. Like really, for all my Tunica fans in here, I want you to get it. But just know this, with God it's not a gamble. With God it's not a gamble. Two of you can agree on anything and touch it, it'll happen. You believe that, church? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for a super practical conversation where we understand that the size of our goals glorify you or they don't. God, let us be a people who pursue you and decide today to live a life that screams who our Father is in the earth. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.